Canola. I'm from um, part of the world, or part of Australia, with the highest percentage of Roundup Ready Canola. I think we're about 70% Roundup Ready. Um, we went into it largely because of triazine resistant radish, to be honest. I'm not sure where the question was. It was up here somewhere, wasn't it? Yeah. So triazine resistant radish forced our hand a bit there and Roundup Ready has been very popular. Our growers find uh, a similar or, similar or better yield and the, there is a price discount, but the oil bonuses often make up for the price discount. So it has become very popular in our area. So just something a little positive about Roundup Ready Canola. Right oh, we've got six gentlemen on the stage here. I haven't even met all of these guys yet. <laughs> so thanks for joining us, guys. I really appreciate it. We're going to dig into harvest weed seed control. I mean, that last session just showed you how good it is to hear from farmers about what they're actually doing on the farm. And here we've got uh, six of them who are going to tell us what they're doing on their farms in regards to harvest weed seed control. So. Um, We've got them in a bit of an order on the on the st on the screen here. I've got a few slides from some of you, and I think uh, Gavin. I don't think I've got your slides, unfortunately. I don't know if you sent us some, did you? Or oh, you've got them here. All right, we'll chuck them on a thumb drive at the end. Just stay there. We'll just do you last. So harvest weed seed control, obviously something we talk a lot about. Uh, let's just get stuck straight into it and hear some of the practicalities. So uh, the first one, uh, Chris, uh, who if you can grab a microphone there, Chris. Um, who we met on the phone the other day. We haven't met in person, but um, Chris, you're a, a contract harvester in this area and, and have had a seed terminator, is that right? And Yeah, that's right, um, Peter. Yeah, so um, yeah, we, we farm as well, we do. So we're yeah, at North of Horsham, we are. So um, my brother and I, we go contract harvesting. Um, not so much the last couple of years, so New South Wales, but um, we, so we cover a lot of acres, up to about 70,000 acres a year. Um, with the headers, so we get to see a lot of lot of uh, different systems, a uh, lot of different weeds and different ideas. So, yep. um, and last year we had the opportunity um, of a customer uh, purchasing uh, the, the seed terminator and um, and putting it on our machine and running it for his for his property only. So sorry, a customer put it on his. Yeah, yeah. So on our machine. Oh, on your machine. Yep. So it went on our machine. He he bought it and right. uh, and went on our machine and we ran it for his uh, program. Okay, well, can you just tell us a bit of the story and how it went and all the stuff? Um, well, the it was. Uh, and so on. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was a bit sceptical for starters. Um, another, you know, bit of uh, steel going on the back of the header, more trouble than that. So it uh, took about two days to put on. Um, so we, we put it in the, in the crop and it just worked. It was very simple to use. Um, the only thing we really had to uh, be careful of was just um, making sure we don't feed any stones in. Leaving spanners, retractable fingers going through the machine, but we didn't have that dramas at all. Um, other thing is hygiene. Uh, we're very um, pedantic about, about hygiene, our, our machinery anyway. So we you just got to keep everything clean. So the uh, there's pulleys underneath and that you just got to blow out because the the, the temperature of the whole machine um, gets fairly hot. Um, so and there's also a monitor in in the in the machine in the in the header in the cabin. And that tells you the vibration of the machine. So if you have dramas, it tells you. It's got a um, low speed alarm and warning, uh, a uh, low speed alarm. So it's two alarms. One's a bit of a warning, and the other one's just say stop, back off, slow down, because you don't want to plug it. Um, so I, I uh, didn't use it hugely. I had a Dutch bloke driving for me, and he's a really good operator, and he had uh, no dramas at all. We did about 100 rotor hours on it, so it ran well. Yep, and what header is that on? What model, John Deere? Uh, so it's a John Deere. It was a last year's model S770. And did you chip the engine, or was it? No, no, no. We um, we're back down near Skipton, so it's Western District. Um, that country you can grow ryegrass like yeah, like like carpet. I've never seen anything like it. And the, and the bloke who we harvest for, he has come to a brick wall about managing ryegrass, and it has worked. I've talked to him. Um, He's an older guy, he's, he's, still, he's in his 70s and still farming and loves it, up with the technology and that. And um, yeah, I was trying to get some photos, but yeah, he, he's not up with that yet. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and um, what about horsepower and fuel and that sort of thing? Yeah, so um, horsepower, um, yeah, we did struggle. It was a, we were in the hills down there and it was all raised beds. Um, so we were doing four ton canola crops, six, seven ton cereal crops. So we were pretty, got back to about 4K. Now, so 
supply about 20 to 25 percent more fuel and capacity back down about 20 percent so um but being a contractor yeah it's not by the hectare that job that was by the hour so um as long as we do a good job so that's why he gets us in um so it's, did you say it's S670? 770. Oh, 770. 770. Can you just so remind me about the horsepower and the size of. No, I think it's about 370 horsepower. So it's not like an S680. Right. Loves so fuel. So it is like we run all the seven series headers. Um, well, I just think it's a better contract of machines. Like weight wise for transport, um, we extend our boxes a little bit bigger than that. But yeah, it's a good all rounded machine. And the thing is, is, a lot of our customers do uh, many, uh, look at the fuel usage per hectare and per hour, and um, it, they are a better machine with lighter crops, particularly in the Mallee and New South Wales. Right. Now, now just, I'm just going to wander back behind you and just say a couple of things back here. So uh, if you haven't seen a seed terminator, it is the rotor with the screens as the staters with these grates with uh, obviously holes and what they've done is over the years is open basically the size of these holes up more and more as the years have gone on. So in the first year they're a bit closer and then they've opened that up another step and they're opening it up another step this year because essentially they're finding they can open those holes up a bit and keep their weed seed kill up so and then reduce the horsepower requirement and feed more into it. So look let's just open it up to the floor. Uh, any any questions there uh, about the seed terminator, Rick? Uh, Chris, uh, green rotor tops. Uh, we were in, um, so we, we harvested uh, canola, which was um, uh, ran up ready canola. Um, so that was uh, spray topped as well, I think. I'm not too sure, but uh, we did uh, peas and beans, so they were all spray topped as well. And bean last year, it was uh, wasn't a, any green. In the crops, so I, I'm not too sure on that one. I believe they're not too bad. I don't think they're too good, to be actually honest. <laughs> actually, I, I think uh, I don't know, there's another question or comment coming here. If anyone else got a comment about the green stuff into? Oh well, Bre uh, Brendan Williams here. No, he's the man. Fantastic. Thanks for those comments. And yeah, from my perspective in WA, um, green stuff is the enemy of all of these mills. Um, they're all, I mean, the vertical HSD, which we'll hear about in a minute, is not as bad, but uh, certainly we've had some issues with uh, green material going into the Terminator. Another question there? Yeah, Chris, you said you got 100, hour, 100 rotor hours sort of experience with it. What sort of time frame were you expecting out of those mills? It's 100 sort of the... Uh, yeah, Keegan, who uh, he's the seed terminator guy who helps put it on. Um, we, we were just sending photos through him, um, and he said that this would probably about a quarter of the life, so another f three years. And I think 300 to 600 hours is typical, and uh, they sell all the bits separately. So they sell the the cages individually, and so the outer cage wears out first because the material's going the fastest at that point. So you can just buy that, and then if you need to, buy the other cages as you go. And uh, both Seed Terminator and um, HSD come in at around about $2.40 or 50 per hectare for the wearing parts in the mills. Is there another question? Uh, snails are one of our biggest uh, issues. Um, anyone got experience with HSDs or Seed Terminators with them? Oh, we didn't have snails in that environment there, so I can't comment. Anybody else in the audience? The paddock we harvested last year, one of them did have snails in it, and it didn't 
No worries with the snails there, yeah. I can't remember what I've heard. <laughs> yeah. One of the things we did find that um, you can't do the stall tests and actually find out the exact losses over the sieves. That's one thing I didn't like about it, so it's a little bit harder to sort of making sure you're not throwing grain out. The, the farmer who we work for, he runs sheep as well, and in one of the comments he said, well, I know I'm killing the weed seeds, but I don't have any uh, sheep feed. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, well, thanks, Chris. We'll keep moving because we've got a few others to get through here before we get to lunch. So it's coming to Mick next. So um, I think I... Uh, Mick, we've got a few photos of your chaff lining kit. Another person I haven't met in person, but we've spoken on the phone. A few years ago, I put on Twitter and I made a presentation, I think, saying chaff lining is for disc farmers uh, on CTF. And Mick called me up and said, I'm neither of those. I've been chaff lining with tines and not CTF. And so I said, all right, well, I want to speak to you. And I think it's that discussion, Mick, actually, which has led to us giving uh, chaff lining a, a much bigger push because it is actually applicable to a lot of farming systems. So can you tell us a bit about yeah, chaff lining in your system? We have actually met, Pete. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I was <laughs> I over... meet a few people on these trips. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was on a wild radish tour over in um, Western Australia in 2014 and the first night we sat down with Pete and I was sitting beside him and he said he'd only just become aware of a, a new form and described it that night. And I thought to myself, that's exactly what I want to do. I don't like the idea of all of this residue burn and that. And so I went home from that tour and that's when I had a crack at it. So I've done five seasons now. And um, I, I've only got experience with brome grass. Uh, that's my weed, uh, rye grass is isn't my weed, um, and I actually like the chaff line. You get your weed seeds into the chaff line, very few of them actually germinate. Um, the ones that do germinate, they, they have very little vigour. You, um, you dig them up and you'll find that they've barely got a root system at all. Um, Self-sown cereals that make it into the chaff line, they grow a lot, um, a lot better the next year but brome grass does very little. Um, and and I per personally, my thoughts on chaff line and brome grass, the chaff line is not the issue um, compared to other forms of harvest weed seed control. The issue is, can you get them in the front? Um, and I've, of the five years I've done it, I've got two seasons, and they were the dryer seasons, so shorter crops, so shorter brome grass, um, less likely to bend over and not go in the front. Um, but also, I think they're the two years that, that the brome seeds didn't shed out of their heads. And, and I, I would consider I had 98 to 100% control in those two years. And in bigger, wetter years with taller crops, longer growing brome, um, much more easily bend over under the head of front. Um, also, I wonder whether softer spring finishes allows them to shed their seeds quicker. Um, and, and I've seen, you know, you wouldn't even consider it 50% control. Um, so it's, a, you know, it, it's what you can get in the front that's, in my mind, more important than which form of harvest weed seed control you use. Great stuff, Mick. So you're, you're not full CTF, is that right? But you're putting the chaff line in the same spot every year? Yeah, I'm on two centimetre, but um, my machinery doesn't match. So, um, yeah, some years or, or some rows that chaff lines will go between two tines when the next crop's sown. Other times uh, a tine will rip straight up the middle of it. I don't really consider that much of an issue. I haven't seen much in as far as ad adverse effects from that. Um, so I don't think that's really that important. Does it ever block the tine? No, I haven't seen that, but then I do farm in the Mallee. <laughs> and now we've got a few photos of your chaff lining shoot um, back here. Can you just tell us a bit about it and what it's made out of and so on? Yeah, so I, I actually made up a, um, a poly shoot which I um, bolt off the, the back of the um, bottom sieve. Um, I use a 7240 case harvester and I basically remove the... the um, the plate which um, makes sure all of the straw and the um, chaff funnels into the spreaders, 
I removed that and, and bolt this in in its place, um, put a baffle on to to separate the the chaff from the the straw, which the straw ends up back in the spreaders, and um, and so it shakes um, with the shaker system, and which you know the reason I went that way was I I was concerned about whether I'd get blocks late at night when things got tougher and more moist and all that, and um, I find it works well. Um, so that's connected to the sieve and it's shaking the whole time, is it? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, which it, it helps it to self-clean. Yeah. Got some other photos of it here. It um, looks pretty narrow. Do you know the width of the opening at the bottom? Yeah, it's only 250 mil. Does it block? Ha, only time it blocked was when the chaser bin driver pulled up and I had to pull up and... and um, before I got the auger off, and yeah, that was the only time I ever blocked it because it was stationary and it couldn't, couldn't, um, it blocked at the bottom. But no, I've never had it block while I've been in motion. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got another photo of it there. I think that's a picture of your baffle, is it? So that's a bit like the Rod Messina design baffle. Um, it's just a, on the right side here, it's just a, a cover. On the on the straw spinners, is that right? And do you know how far that protrudes above the um, sieve? Yeah, it it, it was um, Rod's design, um, and um, it's roughly 300 mil above the back of the sieve, and roughly 300 mil backwards of the back edge of, edge of the sieve. And have you got internal chopper or beater? Yeah, internal chopper. I think that's what we're seeing on the left there. Is it? Yeah. So. Um, and people that I've spoken to uh, with case headers have said it's really beneficial to have that chopper rather than a beater to get these things to work. Yeah, well, I, I noticed that um, it's, it's got a two-speed, the chopper, and, um, and it didn't work as well with the um, chopper in the lower speed. The higher speed, um, no problem at all. It, it threw all of everything from the back of the rotor right up onto the back wall, um, and I had no issues with it trying to hairpin on the front edge of the baffle. And we'll get to some questions now, but five years on and brome grass you've been your main weed, how do you feel that you're going with the with your seed bank and your brome control in general? Well um, obviously rotations and chemicals and everything else is is the the ninety five percent of it and the chaff line is just the the icing on top really. Yeah. Um, I had one particular paddock. Um, I used to do a three-year brome break phase, um, and if they were three good years with good germination, that that would work. And and if one or two of those three years weren't so good, you'd find three years wouldn't be enough. Um, and I I chaff lined in 2015 a um, a crop that had been after the three-year phase. Um, there hadn't been a great three-year phase and there was brome through the, the paddock. Um, next year, after the fourth break, um, didn't see any brome. And that was one of those times I was very confident that I, everything that was out there, I got it in the chaff line and then never saw any more. Um, and it can, in really good circumstances, it can, you know, can be a break in itself, but um, it's what you use at the end of... It, it's. It's not. It's the last thing in the piece of the puzzle. I think it's not the first thing. Yep. And all right. So we'll get Lisa organised with the microphone. So if you've got a question, put your hand up. And while um, we're getting to that question, the last question for me is: any negatives, Mick, about chaff lining? Oh, not that I can see. I don't run any sheep, so I um, don't have sheep eating the chaff line and nudging it round and all that. I've heard other people say that that does happen. Um, I, I think because it's by far the cheapest, the less work, the least work and, and all that, and um, no maintenance costs, um, no extra fuel and um, no slowdown of the harvester productivity, I, I think I'll probably be doing it for a long time. Fantastic. Righto. There's a question at the back. Uh, Mick, do you, do you use, an, use anything special to ignite the rose when you're burning them? Sorry, what was that? How do you ignite all the rose when you're burning them later in the season? No, you don't burn it. Oh, you just leave them? Okay. Yeah, yeah it, basically it just sits there and um, 
Yeah, very, very low a man of um, the brown grass will even germinate in it and is very lax vigour. Um, I've never ever harvested the next year and seen a green str or a strip of brown grass. There might be the odd weed, but um, it's nothing that you would... I've never seen anything that I'd go out there and say, gee, I need to make up a single shield and go down and spray this out of the crop, in the crop. Um, so I'm, it, for me, it works quite well. Um, how about if you grow lentils? I don't know, like... I don't know there's anyone anyway out there who does the chaff line and that with the lentils, like uh, if you get a very high um, chaff line, um, my concern is how are you going to get the lentils in the front without bullnosing the chaff line? Mick, any thoughts? Or Ian, you got some experience with that, have you? What's that? We're going to get... Oh, no, you go, oh, you go first. Yeah, I had just that example last year um, and... I had a brand new Macdon front with one of the, um, the undercarriage sort of, um, uh, what do you call it? The Polypan, Yeah, it? Yeah, I managed to wear that out. Yep. Um, I, interestingly enough, um, I was stripping a lentil crop and there was absolutely no grasses or self-sown barley, which was the previous crop in the lentils. And I'm finding barley um, grains in me sample. And... <laughs> and Interestingly enough, they sat in the chaff line and they got bulldozed into the to the um, into the front. And I would have expected to see these totally rotten stone grass um, grains, but they weren't. Right on. Ian, you've had some experience with uh, lentils and chaff lines. I uh, yes, Pete. The the lentils or the chaff lining, we've done it two years in a row on the same line, and we've had to go and burn them this year because we put the paddock in the lentils, so we can see that we're going to have a large problem with the, the dome in the middle of the harvester. So our view was if you were two and a half to three tonne in wheat crop, or sort of four tonne in the barley crop, you'll probably see that it will um, it'll sort of uh, decay and go away, but above that you're going to have this trail there, and, and that's what we've found. So we actually had to burn it, before, we've burnt half the paddock and we left the other half the paddock to see how we're going to get on. So, mm. But um, that was our problem. It certainly is an issue that does um, come up with chaff lining. Uh, Mick, um, just wondering, uh, do you uh, harvest lower uh, trying to catch those seeds or are you just harvesting your uh, normal height? Oh, I, I've always been a straw taker, so I harvest fairly low anyway. Um, and, um, yeah, so I, I probably, on average, cut probably only 200 mils. But, um, you know, when we've got bigger, heavier crops, I, I'll harvest higher. Righto. Well, thanks, Mick. We, we might keep the show moving so we do get through all of our um, panel. Um, Ian will be next over on this end. Um, and all of these guys, I think... Most of you are coming tomorrow, I think, and uh, at some stage we'll be at the harvesters, and so we might uh, pick on you a little bit there um, in front of the harvesters as well when we're talking about setting the machines up. Righto, so Ian Taylor, you have got a... Um, sorry, Mick, your video didn't work. <laughs> I left that out. Um, quite a few slides here, and it's a bit of a story of uh, moving from narrow windrow burning to chaff lining, is that right? And I can flick through a few slides if you just want to... Um, tell us a bit about it. That's correct. So, Pete... Maybe just where you farm as well. And yep. So on. Farm at Lubeck, uh, about 30 k's east of Horsham here. Uh, farm there with my brother. Been there all my life. Father had the property before that. So, around about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, we bought another property. Had some radish on it. And our farm generally doesn't have any radish on it. So, our approach was how were we going to do, control this? So, brother... He's always on the header. He said, we're going to chaff on it. Uh, sorry, wind road burn, all this. So we started wind road burning mainly because of the, the, the radish that we had on the property, on this new property. And we left it on and we thought this is a great idea. It was a great way to clean up ryegrass and capture ryegrass, which that started off and it proved no end that it, it is a great way to, to reduce ryegrass numbers. So the picture there is um, just to show you how low that you need to go to capture those weeds. That's what the, the purpose of it is, is nothing, nothing uh, scientific there and just what, what the residue you sort of leave on the ground. 
Our view is also by re reducing so much stubble, our pre-emergence worked extremely well on the following year, so we haven't got all that trash. Picture there is to show um, that was our first sort of attempt. You see the leakage coming out through the red circle. So if Peter keeps flicking, so we are getting a loss of grain. Now this picture here, you'll see the results of this. You'll see that the wind was blowing away from the header and there's no ryegrass falling this side of the wheel. So there's a lot of dust and stuff going to the other side. So where I had the circle on the, on the picture there before, there was a leak at the back, back of the header. So the chaff is actually coming through and we were losing ryegrass. Can you go on, Peter? Yep, so it's the next picture. It's just a picture out the back. You've all probably seen that. But actually, the reason I took that was um, we get some contractors in to help us and it's very hard to get them to set up their header the way you want it. So keep going, Peter, please. Did we've you uh, design your own shoot? Or yes, design our plans? own shoots, yeah. Oh, okay. yep. It looks like the plans we put on the WeedSmart website. I was just looking for an easy plug. But right. <laughs> <laughs> so just keep going, just pictures of something. So here we go. We've uh, done the burn here on the right-hand side. And you can see the escapes that slipped out the side. So this is from the windrow burn, and that's where I'm talking about on the other side, the wheel, we've got nice clean, we've got ryegrass and the burn. So that is what you can achieve if you can get it into, into where you want to manage it. So it's all about number one. I think it's Chris who said you've got to get it in the front. And I think we've all said that. Number one is you've got to get it in the front. Number two, you've got to manage it at the back and put it somewhere where you can deal with it, or what you want to deal with it. So, um, obviously just some pictures there of the, uh, the windrow on the ground. Did you manage to burn those without burning the whole paddock? So what's actually happened there, we chaff lined underneath, and I windrowed on top, because we had some, uh, a contractor in helping, and that was the way we managed it. But what I did, I actually went back and bailed all that straw off the top, because I had an opportunity to make some extra dollars. So. We had the chaff liner going and we put the, just opened up the back of the header rather than spreading the straw because we also had the, the Harrington Sea Destructors come in later in the year. Right, eh? So obviously some pictures of burning. Yep. Great we fun. We uh, move on to chaff lining. Got someone's That's underpants here. <laughs> That's there for a reason. That does happen. That was harvesting beans. Um, blocked up in the, in the chaff liner in, in the back. Built right up and, of course... That's Charlie so, <laughs> doing a bit of bonding. Uh, you were windrow burning and then you made the mo definite move to chaff lining? Is yes, that right? so we, st we, we were still doing a bit of both, but at the same time. So um, we didn't know how this chaff line was going to go because of the size of the residue. So that's what I'm talking about. We had uh, some crops of five to six tonne and the residue from the chaff was just so much on the ground. We were wondering what was going to happen, so we... Still did a bit of burning and did a bit of chaff lining, just trying to get a feel on what happened. So we've done that for three years, two years, three years, the chaff lining and chaff lining on top of each other. We had to go and burn it this year and we used the destructor in uh, a trial situation last year too. So have you bought the destructor or you just trialled it? We've bought two destructors as well. Okay, so you've moved from windrow burning to chaff lining to... Um, Destructing. Destructor, Harrington Sea Destructor? Yes. Vertical ones? Yes. Yep, okay, great. We'll hear about those from Craig in a moment. All right, any more comments about the chaff lining, Ian? You've got a few photos there. There's one of, um, of it in canola, and then uh, I think this one was... That's the lentils. So that's... Um, I've actually baled some of the straw off the top of that. That's the lentils of two years of chaff lining, but I've had to reduce that because it was just such a lump there. We could see what was going to happen and we were going to be in trouble. So it does work. There's no doubt about it. You get the weeds in there, they do not germinate. Well, they're very slow at germinating or they're very sick, so they don't really come to a lot. Um, yeah, so they're, they're typical signs, things that you'll see. So you get it in there, set it under the chaff. It, it just doesn't seem to germinate. The burn is still great, but you've got to get everything in the, drop it in the right spot. Obviously, um, Can we just ask, just ask you a little bit about your weed mapping just at the, the end? Weed mapping, yes, yeah, so that's, a, that's one of the paddocks. Um, it's, the blue dots are ryegrass, wild oats, whatever else you do. So the guys in the headers 
sitting there all day touching buttons, and that is used in our cropping program um, because we all sit around the table and say, no, I've got no ryegrass in that paddock. This is, this is what we always go back to to do the crop plan. And um, so, yeah, just in the Trimble screen, they sit there, hit the dot, and it's, we go to the next screen there, Peter. So it's very, very much yield-related and soil-type related to where those weeds are. So remember where they're thick, but up towards the top there, the yellow spots, a little bit of a change in the, in the ground, that's where the ryegrass is. So it's, and it's interesting from 20 years ago when first come home and we've got some farm maps and I've drawn on there we just with a texture and said ryegrass, wild oats, and they're still the same areas. So, mm. But um, we have, you control the numbers of ryegrass with what the methods we are doing. So... Fantastic. So it's interesting chaff lining. So, I mean, we probably should have explained it a bit more at the beginning. It is just putting that chaff on the same space year after year. Um, it started with some guys in Esperance in WA and uh, Mick Fells and some others down there, and it's, it's spread around. Um, really, people like Mick Fells say you don't see many weeds germinate, and that's often true. There are some other growers that say, well, in some situations we do get a lot of weed germination. If they get a very dry summer, we can get more weeds come up in winter. To get a wet summer, we can get more of that rotting um, and in the summer and then less growing in the winter. Mike Walsh um, has started doing some research on it with John Broster and others uh, looking at how much suppression you get. And it's a bit of a tonnes per hectare of chaff, a bit like mulching your garden to stop the weeds coming up. You get enough tonnes per hectare, you can suppress the the weed germination a bit. And it's interesting, we've got some farmers like Ian that are using it as a bit of a means to, before they get to buying the, the destructor that they've been waiting for, and some other farmers like Mick that are really quite happy with chaff lining and, and are going to stick with it. Um, incidentally, I've written a, a booklet about setting your harvester up for chaff lining. It's just been printed last week and we're going to have some copies of it uh, at the harvesters tomorrow. So if, uh, if you're interested in going down this path, I've got a booklet with a Quite a few different headers. I think your which is in there, Mick, and a few other photos from other. Hope you, maybe you didn't know that. I don't know. <laughs> a few other photos from other headers. Um, so yeah, if you're looking to set up, there'll be uh, be a booklet there and lots of info tomorrow. So any questions uh, for for Ian before we move on? Oh, they're great fun. Tim just loved maps. All this IT stuff, it's just fantastic. Isn't it? What do I use it for? Um, not a lot. So uh, that, that particular paddock there you are seen has been prescription farm. So it's been applied nitrogen on a prescription um, on soil based of, of test and everything. So look, we're still trying with it. The, the, the yield map is number one. We've got a yield map for probably 15 years, I suppose. It's good to overlay them, um, get, a, get a picture on what soil types are doing, when they're doing it, what years, dry years, wet years. Now, the, 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 the weed map is it's a good reference to go back to. So you can come in, have a look at our books at any paddock and say what weeds are in there. So when we do that crop planning, that's the, probably the, the big thing. We are looking at can we go out there and sort of precision manage these weeds, save some cost on chemicals. So all that type of stuff. And as you know, the, the sprays that are out there today is starting to be able to do that type of stuff. So, yeah. I, I inspired me. The Gen 4 can do it. I've been trying it with the Gen 4. I've got the assistance there. Same thing. Please. Thanks, Tim. All right, we might keep the show rolling. Um, Craig Bignall is up next. So Craig has travelled out from WA with us to um, be at Weed Smart Week. Um, here's a picture of Craig in front of the rock, um, and uh, and Craig, he actually invented the vertical HSD, and I'll let you tell a little bit of that story, but before that there's a bit of a story of what you're doing before it, so maybe just a little bit about where you farm Craig and then your journey to where you are now. Yeah, sorry, you'll have to sit through a bit. Um, the uh, We farm in the Great Southern, it's the southern end of... Um, Western Australia, halfway between Perth and uh, Albany, and uh, in a 400 mil rainfall, and we're about 70% crop and 30% sh livestock sheep. Um, yeah, that's and we're having a decile four year, so it's looking promising. And we've come from um, lots of weeds where we'd sort of hit that wall with ryegrass, and we'd you know use a seed cleaner to clean our seed. 
to get it into CBH and then um, to realising we had to do something and chaff carts was our first step um, and then the burning issue just got too big, it's just too hard and cost. it's costly and it's, it's oh, it nearly cost me half my farm I reckon but um, because of Mother's Day events and so on and but it's... <laughs> um, <laughs> so burning dumps on Mother's Day was pretty well, popular. Well it's not so much burning them on Mother's Day, it's burning them the week before and and then they just they get away, that was our problem with, with burning so we looked at at dis well, we've watched Ray Harrington's evolution of the the destructor. It's just been amazing how he's sort of built it up, and um, so we decided that was for us. Oh, this is our team. Little guy at the front helped me with the PowerPoint. Um, uh, yeah, keep going, please, Pete. Oh, that was just my dog. Um, just to show that, just to show that um, livestock sort of still an important part of our operation. She thinks she's the biggest part of it. That's where we are uh, down there. Oh, I don't know whether you care, but that's just a uh, like that's our farm, and it's just a. I just wanted to explain. We go from red dirt to white sand to grey clay, all within the space of 50 hectares. I'm not sure if it's the same here, but it's it's a challenging environment for management. What have you done to make that photo? Has that been plaza plowed or something? Or? The top sort of bit's been mouldboarded, and then the bottom bit we did put a plaza in there at some point down the bottom and then the rest of it was done with a speed till and dad's having a bit of fun over there with the excavator this i feel like a bit of a fraud being up here to be honest um because we've still got plenty of ryegrass we've not we've not won yet that was our seed cleaner investment that was i mean pointless really that was nine years ago that's where we went with the um chaff cart um the, the grazing is a, you know, uh, ag pro management, Ed Riggle from WA, he has sort of shown that 2.4 kilograms is sort of an average weight gain for grazing chaff piles over, um, you know, traditional sort of harvesting, I guess. But, and the burning, that just, I just can't handle it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we invested um, in 2015 in the uh, integrated Harrington seed destructor and we had heaps of trouble with it. Macintosh, we're very grateful for Macintosh to bring that to market, though. I think without Devon Gilmore at Macintosh, I really don't know whether it would have would have made it. So, so this is the hydraulic been... one. Yeah. yeah. So this is the hydraulic one, the first one that came out in 2015. Been heaps of updates and and so on. I really think they've got it to where they want it to get it um, compared to where we. Had it. I mean, I think the next slide shows where. Oh, oh this is, this is where we had it. Ran a destructor and a chaff cart, and up the top is it, we ran a 9090 and a 9080, which essentially is the bigger New Holland, same horsepower, both with Steinbauer chips, and um, it's the total hectares and the fuel use. We used 12.7 litres a hectare with the destructor, 12.3 litres with the chaff cart, and. Then, over the program of um, lupins and canola, oh, sorry, wheat, canola and barley, was 23.6 tonnes an hour with the destructor and 21.6 tonnes with the chaff cart and the hectares an hour were virtually identical. That's the result of our, that's, um, oh, the, the hydraulic motors let go and $45,000 worth of parts to go into it. And Macintosh and Son and De Bruyne or whoever, they were amazing, came and took our header away, fixed it, brought it back, and lent us one. Oh, sorry to make you sit through this, but um, the, uh, if you want to be quick, I just um, I love going to other people's farms, looking forward to tomorrow to see what, they're, what they've built to sort of help them get away with their problems. This is something my dad built 20, 30 years ago with maximum sort of tillage, and we still use it to sow pastures today. He built it in his workshop. He built a rock picker. Dolly, that's sort of what we used to use for burning our chaff poles, hook it on the back of a ute and buzz around them because we're quite, we're 100 kilometres sort of from one block to another block. That's a windmill he put on the back of a truck so we can, <laughs> we can drive around and still pump water when the wind's not blowing. That's uh, the Plaza plough, Ben Plaza, who's just an amazing fellow in agriculture, I think. He's just got 
ag at his, you know, his core and his, in his best in, everyone's best interests. But that's sort of renovating. That's doing a good job. And it could be us. <laughs> oh, and I've got no formal um, training, but my dad is sort of an amazing fella and um, has taught me everything he knows, I reckon. And he, he built that belly dumper. He's built a couple of them. And so we thought we'd have a crack at, well, Macintosh, every time they come out and replace something, we'd manage to convince them to leave it in the corner of our shed rather than take it back. So we thought we'd have a crack with all those parts of building a destructor. Um, and that's sort of the, you know, that's, that's starting to build it, just grabbing their bits and just turning it on the side. And essentially it's like the old chaff carts with the axle through the guts. And we were bloody surprised it worked. Um, Sure. Oh, we had our troubles. We had lots of troubles, a few cracks in welds and so on, and and to the point um, and belt slippage. But we did 400 hours with it in that year. Belt slippage, that's sort of the drive off the chopper, and that's uh, to a point where, like I said, I'm not all that educated because I had it spinning the wrong direction. <laughs> That's the new, I'm really pleased to say, Macintosh and Son and, and, um, have taken the idea and f for the evolution of the Harrington Ray's destructor and, and that's, that's what they've built there. It runs off the chopper drive and, and down to that um, mill that's vertical and the shaft goes straight through the bottom. I think you can see one tomorrow, I think. So Craig's being a little modest here. What happened was he, he made the first vertical Harrington C destructor Ray Air Harrington got wind of it and had a look at it and said, that is brilliant. Took the Macintosh guys along and said, yep, we agree. And then they got out and they made eight of them for last harvest, I think, eight or nine. And uh, that was the start of the vertical HST, thanks to Craig uh, tinkering around in the shed and the bits that Macintosh had left lying around. <laughs> And uh, they've been very good about it. When I called Craig and said, do you want to come over and talk about it? He said, oh, I'm not sure if Macintosh are really going to be that happy with me, seeing as though I stole it and <laughs> made it. But they obviously no, They're more than happy uh, with what Craig has done and uh, acknowledge that, um, that innovation. Um, tomorrow we'll, we'll have a, a display unit of a vertical uh, HSD, um, so you'll be able to see the, the commercial commercial product in the shed tomorrow but um, Craig you I think the story is you went from having the Heath Robinson homemade job on the on one header and you've bought or you had the hydraulic which you sold and now you own two machines which you've done one harvest with with the verticals is that right yes that's right yep and and just quickly how, how did they go and um, what are your thoughts about the future they performed really well uh, did have a, an issue with the belt that um, the bracket moved, chopped a belt out. Uh, we didn't have it right at the beginning of the harvest where things are a bit ropey. Um, so I'm, I'm not convinced they'll work any better in that situation. Um, but I mean, we've blocked them before and we blocked the front pretty much at the same time. So it's something gives. Um, so no, they've been, it's performed well. Right, any, uh, any questions of, of Craig? No comment. <laughs> no, we didn't add a respect. <laughs> yeah, so look, we'll hear more a bit uh, about the vertical HSD tomorrow. Um, I mean, they've gone from retailing for about 160 grand to 85 through turning them from hydraulic to vertical and belt driven. So. It's been a massive step. It's been a frustrating process because of all the problems that have been had with the hydraulic and, uh, and there's going to be 120 vertical HSDs in the paddock this year and we're just hoping that, that they have got it right and we're going to have a good harvest and then it's on for young and old. Did you have a... Yeah, just Ag, Ag Pro Management um, did another trial just showing the... because it was a real loss of feed in our paddock, sort of 25 to 30% increase in feed costs after losing the chaff cart and the AgPro management did some work showing that it was virtually identical um, value as the old, like the traditional way of harvesting, chopping and spreading with the destructor. So I thought that was good information. 
Uh, Craig, just before you finish, I mean, the other thing that gets talked a lot about, and there's a big variation in answers to this, and it's about fuel and horsepower and capacity. Um, now, you've put Steinbauer chips in the, in the headers to give you the extra power. Um, what have you found in terms of what's it done for fuel use and, and harvest capacity, having the vertical HSDs on? Well, our experience in, um, is that the Steinbauer sort of takes the header up to where it was previously without the the, the um, destructor. Um, but I was interested to hear comments this morning about a 30% reduction in harvesting capacity and I was just, I probably should have asked the question, we'd seen that when we went from no harvest weed seed set control, sort of head hunting or a bit lower down to, down to the ground level, but we sort of haven't seen any, as my figures showed, any real drop in productivity from going from a chaff cart to a destructor. Yeah, so there's a range of figures there. We'll do our best to get the most accurate ones as we get more info. I know that in uh, Carnama last year, Scott Walton had two S680 John Deere's, one with a vertical HSD and a Steinbauer chip, and the other without either. And they both did um, similar tonnes an hour, with the vertical HSD doing about an extra litre of fuel per hectare. And your fuel figures were something similar, weren't they, Craig? About a litre a hectare? Yeah, they were. Yeah. And so we'll get a range. Well, there is a range of figures that you'll hear about that, and um, yeah, we'll try and get the most accurate ones. Anyway, we're getting close to the end. We've still got two guys to go, so we will try and um, keep moving here. Um, uh, who have we got left? Is it Justin at the end? Justin, I did get some of your slides from. Uh, you probably don't know that they're there. <laughs> um, uh, from our first, or one of our early speakers, um, who passed them on to me. So um, I might just flick through to straight through to your harvest weed seed control, uh, which is the chaff deck. Cool. Um, yeah, so we started out with uh, chaff decks in 2017. So we've had a reasonable harvest of 17, probably a not so good one last year. Um, I think seed termination is probably the ultimate. It's thrown up some other challenges that we've you know, we're probably aware of before we went into it, but they've probably come to tuition now. Um, in like the loading of the residue, maybe some carryover with some lontral and things like that in that residue with uh, the lentil phase. Um, this year we're seeing water logging um, in those tram lines with that chaff. So if you've got two tram lines in our 30 foot system um, where you're losing crop because of water logging and high chaff loading, then there's probably, probably an issue there. So. Um, so that being said, I think for us, the seed termination going forward is probably um, the way that we'll end up heading. Um, but uh, probably one thing that hasn't been touched on that I think is fairly important in getting a good result is the use of the windrower um, in our system. So hooking into that uh, barley in particular, um, being able to go a lot, a lot earlier than what you know you would with a combine um, still be able to hit that malt market not using glyphosate or if you choose to use a spray line set up as we've got the photo there um, you've got you've got options but you're getting that rye grass or that brown grass while it's still standing it hasn't fallen over because as Tim highlighted we've got lentils we've got barley and we've got canola they're all time sensitive they've all got a byproduct to come off whatever dollars a hectare it is whatever the risk is um, if you put the barley in a windrow, it's you know somewhat safe. Yes, it can get some weather on it, but it doesn't lose heads. You get the rye grass in the windrow. You can process it with the chaff deck. You can put it back on a tram line. You can do something about it. Um, so all that being said, clethodim's probably working better. If you said that you had a 70% success rate with it, um, you're better off having 70% success on a lower plant density. Um, so we're seeing some good results there. Certainly not seeing any big blowouts coming off the tram lines. Um, we seem to do a good job with clethodim in that, in that lentil phase. Um, it seems to work quite well on those tram line situations because it's, it's under stress. Like it just seems to, seems to kill it quite well. Um, yeah, and as you know, I suppose the theme's been uh, mix all your options up and make sure everyone's a winner. Fantastic. Now just in terms of the chaff deck, um, any issues with it? Has it performed you know, well just as a, as a piece of machinery? Or? Yeah, look, it's just bolted up. Um, 
you know, for a 20 grand spend, roughly or thereabouts, I think that's about what they're worth, um, for a 20 grand spend for the value that you can get out of it um, and what we've achieved in two years, um, it's, it's been impressive. Fantastic. And we will, we do have primary sales with us um, here and they'll be there tomorrow with a, uh, a chaff deck uh, and so you'll be able to see it and, and speak to them. They are the uh, makers and, and distributors of chaff deck these days. I'm interested in your comments about um, swathing barley. Um, so Ray Harrington is someone we talk a lot about. He, he called me last week and said, Peter, we're calling the shots, which is Ray speak for we've arrived, we've beaten ryegrass. And it, he said it took him eight to ten years of constant effort. And you would say, oh, it's because he's had the Harrington seed destructor on the whole time. And he and I would argue that it was the aggressive swathing that he brought in in those first few years to just make sure that he was increasing the number of weed seeds that he was getting in the front. And so, and particularly when we've got glyphosate under threat for that crop topping option in barley, I just wonder whether swathing barley in the future could be a, a really big tool. So, any comments? Um, so we started uh, swathing our barley again. It's something that Dad had done a lot of years ago, but we started again in 2016 um, on the back of what was a pretty wet season, lodge crops, regrowth, second growth, all those types of things. Just the stuff wasn't going to ripen. The large majority of the crop was the stuff that had fallen over. You know, there wasn't going to be a huge volume come out of that second growth type stuff. So we made the made the call to get a windrow up, swath the whole lot, be able to harvest the stuff and get it in the bin. Um, and we sort of noticed, you know, in the ryegrass that was in that in that swath windrow, you'd go to dissect it and the seed didn't seem to be viable, like it didn't fill. Um, and from that point onwards, we said, hang on, this is, this is a no-brainer. Like, if that's all we do, it's a step in the right direction. But, you know, the, the further we get down it, I think the bigger and more powerful the tool becomes. The big question everyone asks when you're swathing barley is how do you make sure you can pick it up again? Are you going on an angle or something or using a mixer belt or what are you doing to make sure you can pick it up? Well, with the control traffic system, obviously an angle's not an option. Um, there's a lot to do with windrower setup, so belt speed, reel position. When you've got that opportunity, if it's a lodge crop, then it gets a little bit harder. Um, but we don't seem to have any issues in picking it up. Sometimes it's a barley crop back on a wheat stubble, so you've got that that wheat crop from the previous year. So essentially it's a seven and a half inch spacing um, on the deck because of the, the two year stubble. So um, yeah, we don't seem to have an issue. Um, we at one stage thought that we weren't gonna do it last year as in swath the barley, because we were concerned that we mightn't have picked it up. Um, in the end, we did the whole lot. And on a lower biomass year, it still didn't cause us any grief. Excellent. Just to clarify there, some of our growers are seeding on the angle and then um swathing back on the trams and picking and putting it back on the trams so that they can uh, lay their swaths across uh, an angle. Um, excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Justin. Any, any questions from the floor? Chris. Uh, just with all these uh, like chaff decks and tram lines and that, one of the things in the Woomera here uh, is mice. Now, um, how, how, do you, how do you go with mice in, in that sort of environment? So, yeah, certainly um, not so much this season just gone because there wasn't any around, but the 2017 year we did see some hibernation in those um, sort of tram lines, I suppose, so there was a little bit of damage out um, from them, but probably the big curve ball that's, you know, it's been hanging around for a few years for us, but it's millipedes and slaters um, and the habitat that it creates for those things and canola is probably not all that nice. Earwigs? Earwigs as well. Yep, so we've got to be aware of those those other pests that can build up in there. I know that Steve Henry, who's the CSRO mouse researcher, he um, has talked about maybe it's an opportunity to just bait there and reduce our baiting costs, but it's something that's still to be trialled. Sort of getting close to out of time, uh, we are going to just go for five more minutes and then, then we'll be at lunch. So just bear with us. Gavin, I think uh, Kiralee's going to help us out, see if we can get your, um, your thumb drive going. But um, 
Gavin, another one on the panel that I didn't get a chance to meet before we got up on the stage, but understand that you have gone down the chaff cart line, is that right? And uh, yeah, so we originally started off narrow windrow burning, um, been doing that for a fair while with uh, predominantly canola rows, um, and then it didn't really fit in with our well, sheep, I suppose, so we couldn't graze the stubbles, so we were looking for another option. Um, yeah, so, so you're farming and, and it's mixed farming, I take it? Yeah, mixed farming. Um, so we farm at Lubeck um, and also over near Edenhope as well. So, um, yeah. Here we go. we got your slides up there. Thanks, Kiralee. Uh, we might need the thicker thing back in. Oh, OK, thanks. Um, yeah, so if you keep flicking through, this is just the um, window burning of of canola, so we made a shoot, uh, and that worked very well. Um, so yeah, then we moved on to the chaff cart. Um, so this one come from up in New South Wales. Um, yeah, so I've ran this for three years now. Um, yeah, seen some pretty good results so far, if you keep flicking through. Um, yeah, it's just another photo of it. Uh, so it's pretty simple, really. Um, just got the um, the draper belt that that um, delivers the chaff up into the cart. Um, get going, yeah. So then um, we've got a new drawbar made up under the uh, under the harvester there. So that goes right through to the the front axle, uh, bolts up onto the front axle there. Um, then we replace the shaker tray on the back of the header there to divert the chaff onto the cart. And have you lifted those spinners up a little notch, or are they...? Yeah, yep, they've come up a little bit, yep. yep. Um, yeah, so go to the next one, then just a couple of hydraulic valves on the side of the header. Uh, couple, yeah, some couplers there. So it's just as simple as flicking a switch in the cab and that diverts the oil to the cart. Um, and then the baffle in the back of the header there to split the chaff and the straw. So we still spread the straw as normal. How many years have you been on the chaff? Oh, we've done it for three. Three. Chaff cart, yep. Um, yeah, so that's what you end up with. So um, a bloke will go around the line of piles um, after harvest there and just do a um, fire break around them. And then, and then so we wait until about oh, a week or two before the cedar actually goes in the paddock. So we wait until it's cooled right down, sort of that mid to late April. Um, and we still, yeah, still manage to get a really good burn, uh, and it, so I suppose it reduces the um, risk of fire escapes. And are you grazing them as well? And grazing them too, yeah. Well, the, yeah, the cleaner paddocks anyway. Um, so this photo, a uh, bit of an accidental trial here. The, uh, so yeah, there was a dump up the top of the screen there, and then um, the back door didn't close fast enough, which is just a simple adjustment in the cab. So, as you can see, um, the chaff has gone uh, out of the back of the header, up into the cart, and then straight back onto the ground again. And uh, so, yeah, it's all left a it's left the windrow there. So, as you can see, there's plenty of weeds in the windrow, which would normally be in that, um, in that pile up the top there and then get burnt, burnt up. So, sort of good to see a few accidental trials around the joint. Um, yeah, and so we're also grazing the piles. So, um, we nearly get right through uh, summer and autumn without feeding, hand feeding sheep, I suppose. Uh, yeah, because of these piles, which is, a, yeah, definitely a, a major benefit with the cart. And so uh, that's sort of what, what's left after they've been through and, yeah, picked through them. Are you grazing all um, crop types? Ah, uh, yeah, yep. So that one's wheat, yeah, it grazes barley, lupins uh, and beans as well. And we have done canola and vetch, yeah. Do the sheep need any encouragement to eat the wheat chaff piles? Uh, sometimes they do, sort of depends on the year. Um, but all the other crops, say, yeah, they go straight for them pretty much, especially the legumes. Mm -hmm. So do you, if, do you end up trailing some well, lupins or something? Yeah, I have done so before, yeah. Um, just, yeah, chuck some beans on the piles and, and then they, yeah, seem to go for them or pick through them. So we'll still... Um, Still go along and burn what's left that the sheep leave behind, but there's no reason why you couldn't sow through that easy enough. And that's uh, pretty much what's left 
once they've been burnt, so it just burns right down to the ground. Um, just to a pile of ash. You don't get bare patches in crop? After? Not really, not really. We're pretty high rainfall, so, um, yeah. It's pretty, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's just another photo. You can see the, the row of chaff piles across the middle of the screen there. Um, yeah, so they've been all burnt up and then the cedar will just go straight through them as normal. And what about the sheep? Any comments on how they're doing grazing piles compared to just normal paddock grazing? Uh, well, we don't... I suppose we don't have any uh, paddocks without piles anymore. We run it for 100% of the cropping um, program. Um, but yeah, they definitely do, definitely gets us a lot further over the summer, autumn period, um, yeah, than before we had the cart, I suppose, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the future hold? Are you sticking with the chaff cart or are you, what are you thinking? Uh, yeah, I think so for now. Um, I suppose the, the grazing side of it has got such a big benefit that um, that's sort of what's keeping us in it, but uh, always open to options, I suppose, down the track. Fantastic. All right, thanks for that, um, Gavin. Yeah, is there any, any questions? I know you're probably getting a little hungry, but uh, any questions for Gavin about the chaff car? Up the back there, there's a couple of questions. Um, Um, yeah, on really like really windy days, you can see it blowing around a bit. Um, it's not really a big issue though. I suppose you could always put a um, cover over the over the belt going up to the cart to reduce that. But yeah, you don't you don't really have too much trouble. There's another one up there as well, I think. Oh, it's um, it's not too bad actually. Um, yeah, one bloke will. Go around and you, know, you probably spend a few arvos doing it. So yeah, it doesn't take take long at all, really. Once they once you've done a bit of a fire break, I suppose. Yeah, and they just um, sit there and burn. Craig, I think when you had a chaff cut, you found it to be <laughs> a bit more expensive and difficult than that. Yeah, I reckon five dollars a hectare is what we it took us um, three months with our best people doing it, and uh, and a lot of time. Was that using the same approach, putting them in a row across the middle, like that sort of thing? Yeah. Yes, yep, putting them in a row and running around it. Um, we just, I'm not sure if your weather's the same as ours, but we have, like, we can often get strong winds that sort of pop out of the blue. Um, they, they don't seem to forecast until about two days out, and that's sort of what gets us into trouble. But $5 a hectare is what, it, what we charge ourselves to do it. $2 a hectare is another number that we've bandied around. I think it does depend a bit on your farm too, hey? When you've got the big wide open plains and you've got the neat row across the middle, the machine has found that um, it's very quick and easy for them to do up in Mullawa, but the smaller paddocks in the southwest, probably a bit of a different story. Yeah. Another one up here. Uh, no, I haven't, but I believe uh, it's been done before. Um, yeah, we don't really do any hay or anything like that, so, um, yeah, haven't gone down that path. Yeah, there are a few people that do a bit of baling of them, so the, the chaff carts with a conveyor belt do put some short straws off the sieves into the bale, which means that they've got a bit of straw in them. People that intend to bale them would also sort of set their chopper so it does throw a bit of extra straw on the belt sometimes, and I think there's a particular baler, I think, is it a six string baler, does that sound right, that you need, or a five string, it, you need a, yeah, you need a, a good baler to be able to, to uh, pick them up, and they say you can't sort of move them around too much, they're a bit of an unstable bale, but certainly I uh, know that um, in WA, some of our chaff cart guys, like Lance Turner, when there's a tight year and there's money to be made um, from selling straw to farmers that need some feed. Um, they have gone and yeah, run down the bales. And one good story I had was a guy called me up and said, I've paid for my chaff cart in the first year. He said, I've harvested my canola. I've got these big black dumps. <laughs> he was just realised how much canola he'd always chucked out the back of his header. So he got his header and he drove him back through his dumps and picked up 50 grand worth of canola. <laughs> uh. Okay, 
Look, we probably are all getting a little bit hungry. I really like to thank our whole panel here. We've covered a lot of the harvest weed seed control tools, and we'll cover more of it tomorrow at the harvesters. Um, so thank you very much, guys, for putting your presentations together and sitting up on the stage and being interrogated. So please give them a round of applause.